Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, July 29th. Today is the day the LCMS commemorates the lives of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany. I am using crappy laptop webcam and crappy laptop microphone, so I apologize in advance for the sound quality tonight. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually, forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love and I will meditate on your statutes. Our New Testament reading tonight is from the book of Acts, chapter 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since though you... We, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for distinction, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. We even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me, but this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything else against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Augsburg Confession, Article 24 on the Mass, and Article 25 on Confession. 
the Mass. Our churches are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass. Uh, just to clarify, the Mass is the divine service with Holy Communion. The Mass is held among us and celebrated with the highest reverence. Nearly all the usual ceremonies are also preserved, except for the parts sung in Latin are interspersed here and there with German hymns. These have been added to teach the people. For ceremonies are needed for this reason alone, that the uneducated be taught what they need to know about Christ. Not only is Paul commanded that a language understood by the people be used in church, 1 uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 9, but human law is also commanded it. All those able to do so partake of the sacrament together. This also increases the reverence and devotion of public worship. No one is admitted to the sacrament without first being examined. The people are also advised about the dignity and use of the sacrament, about how it brings great consolation to anxious consciences, so that they too may learn to believe God and to expect and ask from him all that is good. This worship pleases God, Colossians 1, 9-10. Such use of the sacrament nourishes true devotion toward God. Therefore, it does not appear that the Mass is more devoutly celebrated among our adversaries than among us. It is clear that for a long time the most public and serious complaint among all good people is that the Mass has been made base and profane by using it to gain filthy wealth, 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. Everyone knows how great this abuse is in all the churches. They know what sort of men say Masses for a fee or an income, and how many celebrate these Masses contrary to canon law. Paul severely threatens those who use the Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy ma manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.27 Therefore, when our priests were warned about this sin, private masses were discontinued among us, since hardly any private masses were celebrated except for the sake of filthy gain. The bishops were not ignorant of these abuses. If they had corrected them in time, there would now be less discord. But until now, they have been responsible for many corruptions seeking, seeping into the church. Now, when it is too late, they begin to complain about the church's troubles. This disturbance has been caused simply by those abuses that were so open that they could no longer be tolerated. There have been a great disagreement about the Mass, that is, the sacrament. Perhaps the world is being punished for profaning the Mass for such a long time, and for tolerating this in the churches for so many centuries, by the very men who were both able and duty-bound to correct this situation. It is written in the Ten Commandments, The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus 27 But since the world began, nothing that God ever ordained seems to have been so abused for filthy wealth as the Mass. An opinion was added that infinitely increased private Masses. It states that Christ, by his passion, made satisfaction for original sin and instituted the Mass as an offering for daily sins, both venial and mortal. From this opinion has arisen the common belief that the Mass takes away the sins of the living and the dead simply by performing the outward act. Then they began to argue about whether one Mass said for many is worth as much as special Masses for individuals. This resulted in an infinite number of Masses. With this work, people wanted to obtain from God all they needed, and in the meantime, trust in Christ and true worship were forgotten. Our teachers have warned that these opinions depart from the Holy Scripture and diminish the glory of the Passion of Christ. For Christ's Passion was an offering and satisfaction, not only for original guilt, but also for all other sins, as it is written. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10.10 10. Also, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10.14 it is an unheard of innovation in the church to teach that by his death, Christ has made satisfaction only for original sin and not for all other sin. So it is hoped that everybody will understand that this error has been rebuked for good reason. Scripture teaches that we are justified before God through faith in Christ when we believe that our sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. Now, if the Mass takes away the sins of the living and the dead simply by performing it, Justification comes by doing masses and not of faith. Scripture does not allow this. But Christ commands, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, the mass was instituted so that those who use the sacrament should remember in faith 
the benefits they receive through Christ and how their anxious consciences are cheered and comforted. To remember Christ is to remember his benefits. It means to realize that they are truly offered to us. It is not only, it is not enough only to remember history. The Jewish people and the ungodly also remember this. Therefore, the Mass is to be used for administering the sacrament to those that need consolation. Ambrose says, because I always sin, I always need to take the medicine. Because the Mass is for the purpose of giving the sacrament, we have communion every holy day, and if anyone desires the sacrament, we offer it on other days, when it is given to all who ask for it. This custom is not new in the Church. The Fathers before Gregory make no mention of any private Mass, but they speak a lot about the common Mass, Communion. And that, by, by the way, means every Sunday Communion and every festival day Communion, including all those ones that happen during the week, which would be like the one today. But we don't do those uh, midweek services anymore. St. John Chrysostom says that the priest stands daily at the altar, inviting some to the communion and keeping back others. It appears from the ancient council decisions that one person celebrated the Mass for whom all other presbyters and deacons received the body of the Lord. The records of the decisions of the Council of Nicaea state, let the deacons, according to their order, receive the Holy Communion after the presbyters, from the bishop or from a presbyter. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.33 has this command in regard to communion, wait for one another, so that there may be a common participation. Therefore, since the Mass among us follows the example of the Church, taken from the Scripture and the Fathers, we are confident that it cannot be disapproved. This is especially so because we keep the public ceremonies, which are for the most part similar to those previously in use only the number of the Masses differs. Without a doubt, these might be reduced in a helpful way because of very great and clear abuses. For in older times, even in churches attended the most often, the Mass was not celebrated every day, as the tripartite history testifies. In Alexandria, every Wednesday and Friday the scriptures are read, and the doctors expound them, and all things are done except the solemn rite of communion. Article 25 Confession. Confession in the churches is not abolished among us. The body of the Lord is not usually given to those who have not been examined and absolved. The people are very carefully taught about faith in the absolution. Before, there was profound silence about faith. Our prize, our people, are taught that they should highly prize the absolution as being God's voice and pronounced by God's command. The power of the keys is set forth in its beauty. They are reminded what great consolation it brings to anxious consciences, and that God requires faith to believe such absolution as a voice sounding from heaven. They are taught that such faith in Christ truly obtains and receives the forgiveness of sins. Before, satisfactions were praised without restraint, but little was said about faith, Christ's merit, and the righteousness of faith. Therefore, on this point, our churches are by no means to be blamed. Even our adversaries have to concede the point that our teachers have diligently taught the doctrine of repentance and laid it open. Our churches teach that naming every sin is not necessary, and that consciences should not be burdened with worry about naming every sin. It is impossible to recount all sins, as Psalm 19.12 testifies, who can discern his errors. Also Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? If only sins that could be named are forgiven, consciences could never find peace. For many sins cannot be seen or remembered. The ancient writers also testify that a listing of sins is not necessary. For in the decrees, Chrysostom is quoted. He says, I do not say that you should make your sins known in public, nor that you should accuse yourself before others. But I would have you obey the prophet who says, Make known your ways before God. Psalm 37.5 Therefore, confess your sins before God, the true judge, with prayer. Tell your errors, not with the tongue, but with the memory of your conscience, and so forth. And the gloss of repentance admits that confession is of, of human right only. Nevertheless, because of the great benefit of absolution, and because it is otherwise useful to the conscience, confession is retained among us.
and we will continue tomorrow evening with Article 26, which is titled The Distinction of Meats, uh, which is actually about uh, adiaphora, about things that are neither commanded nor forbidden in the church. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany were disciples with whom Jesus had a special bond of love and friendship. John's Gospel records that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. On one occasion, Martha welcomed Jesus into their home for a meal. While Martha did all the work, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listening to his word and was commended by Jesus for choosing the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. When her brother Lazarus died, Jesus spoke to Martha this beautiful Gospel promise, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Ironically, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Jews became more determined than ever to kill Jesus. Six days before Jesus was crucified, Mary anointed his feet with a very expensive fragrant oil and wiped them with her hair, not knowing at the time that she was doing it in preparation for Jesus' burial. We now join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As always on Wednesdays, our Wednesday prayer is the shorter litany. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, your beloved Son befriended frail humans like us to make us your own. Teach us to be like Jesus' dear friends from Bethany, that we may serve him faithfully like Martha. Learn from him earnestly like Mary and ultimately be raised by, by him like Lazarus. Through their Lord and ours, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.